Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Law. What are the big issues and the tough decisions facing the United States Congress? Today on Public Affairs Roundtable, we hope to get an insider's viewpoint. That insider is Congressman Dan Burton from Indiana's 6th District, a Republican, a conservative, a Reagan man. Uh, Congressman, welcome. Uh, you served in the Indiana legislature a number of years, both the Indiana House and the Indiana Senate. You've been in the uh, Congress now for three years. How do you compare the operations of those two? Well, well the legislative process is relatively consistent with the Indiana General Assembly, but the, the big difference is, as you know, Larry, I serve in the minority. And all the time I served in the Indiana House and Senate, I was in the majority, and uh, being in the minority isn't much fun. Uh, Tip O'Neill and the leadership of the House uh, rule with an iron hand, and uh, it's only on rare occasions that we're able to, through legislative uh, uh, brinksmanship, get things done that we want done. You were elected in 82, re-elected in 84, uh, and have been at the forefront in, in discussing foreign policy issues. I think perhaps uh, that's where you get your ink in Indiana. Has that been a specialty? Is that where you've directed your energy as a congressman? Well, I'm very concerned about my constituents' problems. Uh, first and foremost, I work for 550,000 people in the 6th Congressional District, and uh, that's my number one concern. But in addition to that, I'm very concerned about uh, our adversaries and what they're doing worldwide, in particular the Russians, the Soviet Union. And as a result, uh, I was asked to serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and on the African Subcommittee and on the uh, Western Hemisphere Subcommittee that deals with Central America. And I jumped at the chance because I'm very interested in those areas. And it gives me a chance to uh, watch what the uh, Soviets and their puppets are doing, uh, the Cubans and the Nicaraguans and uh, the Libyans and so forth. And it gives me a chance to be more knowledgeable on world problems. So I enjoy serving on the Foreign Affairs Committee, but my first responsibility is to the 6th District here. People are questioning that posture now. Uh, the Soviets are concerned about movies like Rocky IV, uh, Red Dawn, where it is an us versus them. It is an adversarial position. And, and people are saying that in the pursuit of, of world peace, in the pursuit of trying to uh, get the reins on the proliferation of nuclear weapons, we really need to abandon that sort of us versus them, that adversarial position. Uh, you don't buy that? No, I don't. I think uh, uh, we need to have patriotic films. Uh, they, they're a little, they go a little further than maybe uh, reality would dictate. And nevertheless, uh, I, I applaud patriotic films that make people believe that the United States uh, ought to be strong and ought to uh, fight against those countries that are tyrannical in nature and try to take away people's freedoms. Now, the Soviet Union has one objective. They've not changed since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, and that's world domination. And being on foreign affairs, I've seen firsthand where they're moving. They don't move directly except in very rare instances. In Afghanistan, they've gone in with their own troops. But usually they supply uh, revolutionaries, uh, like in Nicaragua. They sent 18,000 tons of war materials into Nicaragua last year. And already uh, uh, this year they've, they've started delivering supplies. Uh, they sent 68,000 tons of war materials into, Nic into Cuba. Uh, they sent uh, uh, $2 billion in military supplies into Angola, $1 billion in military supplies into Mozambique which is just north of uh, South Africa, and we get five minerals that are absolutely vital to the security of our country from that part of the world. And 40% of the free world oil supplies go around the southern tip of Africa. So the Soviet, and they're, they're, they're supplying Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, who's in the news right now. So uh, the Soviets uh, directly aren't involved in military conflicts, but they're using their surrogates, their puppets, to expand their sphere of influence in many parts of the world. And I think it's important that the American people be aware that there is a struggle that goes on. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev is very talented, and, and he uh, makes uh, speeches that sound very, very conciliatory in nature. But the man is, uh, has steel teeth. He is uh, after uh, more and more of the world. Uh, he's going to continue to sponsor wars of revolution. He sponsors and supports people like Gaddafi. And I think the American people need to be aware of that. And I applaud any effort to make people feel patriotic and uh, bring about an awareness of that fact. Dan, uh, let me jump in here because uh, 
A couple of things come to mind. Uh, as you talk about this concept of patriotism, <clears throat> uh, what does that mean? It, it <clears throat> probably means different things to many people, but what does it mean to you? Well, it means a love of America, uh, first and foremost. It means uh, uh, doing what's necessary to keep this country free, which means keeping this country strong, making sure we have a nice, a strong uh, national defense posture. Uh, and uh, uh, remembering that, uh, you know, uh, America is our homeland and we have a, a responsibility not only to love it but to protect it because it's, uh, it's, it's where we live and where the future generations are going to be living in this country. So but, but, patriotism to me, me means uh, putting America first. But isn't that word love, isn't that a word that, is, that comes to many different applications and different minds? Uh, isn't, aren't you talking about uh, absolute solutions to very abstract and complex problems? Well, I don't mean to simplify the situation. Uh, obviously, uh, solutions to these various problems are vary, you know. Uh, but when you're talking about patriotism, I think that the things that uh, I learned as a boy in school uh, should be taught to almost every uh, child. I think they should grow up saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and singing the Star Spangled Banner and do things like God Bless America so that they know that this is their country and they owe an allegiance to it. If the, the, the things that come to my mind, at least in terms of talking about uh, patriotism, are things like honesty and fairness and productivity. In other words, that we have a productive nation, that we treat each other in a fair manner, and also a focus upon being honest in terms of an honest day's work. But let me get back to, a, I think, a very important issue. And the National Journal, for example, is a nonpartisan research organization, and they have said that you are perhaps one of the most conservative politicians in the nation's capital, uh, that on the issues of economic, social, and foreign policy, you are perhaps the most conservative. Can you tell us uh, what it means to be a conservative in 1986? Well, I think everybody has a, de a different definition of what a conservative is. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, people view me as a strong pro-free enterprise person and, and believing in the economic system of the United States of America. But I have been criticized uh, by other people uh, for being a little more liberal than I should have been on issues like uh, uh, the uh, auto content legislation or trade bills that have come before the Congress. Uh, I feel very strongly, for instance, that we've been uh, taken advantage of by countries like Japan, our friends on Taiwan, uh, South Korea, because uh, we have a terrible imbalance of trade, and while we have that imbalance of trade, that trade deficit, uh, they are erecting trade barriers, artificial trade barriers and uh, import restrictions against our products that keep us from selling our products over there while they're dumping their products over here, and it's costing American jobs. So uh, I've supported trade, trade legislation, which some businessmen say, my gosh, that's anti-free uh, enterprise and anti-free trade. Uh, so it depends on who you're talking to. I think when you're in Congress, you have to be realistic. If you're uh, a strong supporter of the free enterprise system and free trade, you're going to be labeled a conservative on domestic and economic issues. But uh, uh, in certain cases, you have to be realistic and say we've got to do something to stop this, this uh, problem that may exist. For instance, the auto content uh, legislation. And in that case, you might be uh, judged on that issue a little more liberal. But isn't, you know, getting back to patriotism then, if, if, if I at least define patriotism as being a productive automobile worker, and if we have uh, protectionist policies, doesn't this really cut down on our productivity in the sense that the workers in this area are not being as productive as they could be vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, right now, we, are, we just uh, have a new agreement with the Yugoslavian government. They're going to be selling a lot of uh, uh, new Yugoslavian cars to our country. They pay their workers 60 cents an hour, and they are a communist country. The government sets those wage rates. They have no labor unions over there. And uh, as a result, they can produce a car, send it halfway around the world, and sell it for under $4,000. There's no way that the United States auto worker and the auto industry can be competitive with that product uh, because of the system over there. And I think uh, that uh, we ought to do things that protect America in that particular case because we're being taken advantage of by this particular system. Uh, now, you may say uh, that's, that's uh, 
by your definition, not patriotic. I think it is. I think we ought to think of America first and what's in our best interest and then uh, worry about the other fellows. Some conservatives who back President Reagan in 80 and again in 84 say he's become too modern in his position since he's had to become a, a compromise politician as well to get legislation. Uh, are you still satisfied with Ronald Reagan as a conservative? I think anybody in that office has to compromise occasionally. I mean, you, you can't be set in concrete with a legislative system like we have and get anything done. We have a House that's controlled overwhelmingly by Tip O'Neill and the Democrats. We have a small margin of, uh, in, in, in the Senate, but those fellows think very independently. And uh, I think the president has to compromise in order to be an effective president and in order to lead. Now, I would say that I agree with the president on what he does probably 90 to 95 percent of the time, and that's a pretty good grade in anybody's book. But I do disagree with him on a number of issues. Some trade legislation, uh, I disagree with him on uh, some of the ways we've handled the, the terrorist problem right now. Uh, I disagree on giving money to the IMF and the, uh, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we, we were asked to vote for $8.4 billion for that last year, and that money goes into a separate organization. We only have 18 percent of the votes in that, although we pr provide about one-third of the hard currency. And that money is loaned to communists and third world countries who spit in our eye in the, in the UN, and uh, they're required to pay five percent or less in interest on the loans. They don't even repay the interest, let alone the principal, and they keep uh, taking us to task around the world. And I said to the president, I think we ought to have bilateral agreements with Mexico or Brazil or whoever so that we extract from them some kind of a uh, a fair uh, agreement for us loaning them money, maybe a preferred trade status, whatever it might be, rather than going through a, an entity like the World Bank. So I have had my differences with President Reagan, but overall I think he's done an outstanding job. Let's look at the issue of, of terrorism uh, as it relates directly to Libya and Gaddafi. Uh, this week the President announced some uh, sanctions. He doesn't want American businesses doing business with Libya. He wants Americans out of Libya. Uh, do you think he should go further? Well, first of all, uh, he did two things last night. He said that uh, he wants to impose economic sanctions against Libya, uh, which I, I truly don't believe will work. I think that our, our friends overseas who buy oil from Libya, who do business with Libya, are going to be reluctant to uh, cut off their nose despite their face, even though they agree with us. I'm sure they agree with us, but they have economic considerations involved here, and I think that many of our friends over there will not in, be involved in economic sanctions. So I, I don't believe ultimately that's going to work. The second thing he did was he said we're going to get the Americans out of there. I think that's a plus. I think we need to get our Americans out of there to show that we mean business, uh, number one. And number two, that gets American citizens out of the danger area in the event that we have to take further action. Libya right now has between 10 and 20 terrorist camps over there, maybe more than that. And uh, they are training terrorists by the thousands. They're training terrorists by the thousands in Iran. They're training terrorists by the thousands in the Bekaa Valley. And these people are going to be uh, using their terrorist training uh, throughout the Middle East, in Europe, and I believe ultimately in the United States of America if we don't do something. So I think we need to, uh, we need to have a three-pronged approach in the area of terrorism. Number one, we need to use our intelligence agencies to find out where they're training these terrorists and what they propose to do. And I think we've been doing that to some degree, and I can't get into some of that because it's, it's, in, it's secret. Second, I think we need to preempt a terrorist act. Uh, if, we, if we know what they're going to do, we need to take a action to stop that from happening. And I believe that's been done to some degree. Not enough, but it's been, we've been doing some of that. And third, which we have not been doing, is we need to have a policy of swift, swift retribution in the event that a terrorist activity takes place. They need to know that there's going to be a very, very high price to pay for perpetrating an atrocity upon American citizens or American property. And until they know that price is going to be very high, I think they're going to continue to feel like they're being rewarded for their terrorist activities and they're going to continue to do it. That's pretty much the Israeli position, isn't it? Uh, I think the Israelis uh, use that philosophy and uh, uh, they're in a little different situation because they're surrounded entirely by uh, uh, the uh, Arab nations and uh, they all uh, 
are constantly putting pressure on, uh, on, on Israel, with the exception of Egypt, who hasn't been too friendly with them lately. But uh, the, uh, the Palestinians, uh, uh, the PLO in particular, uh, have not uh, recognized Israel's right to exist. They want to destroy them. And so Israel doesn't have any alternative, I think, but to retaliate and respond whenever there's a terrorist act. Is this kind of hardline approach, is it important that we have the support of our allies in this? Do you think we would, or should we do it regardless? Well, I think where United States property and United States citizens are involved, particularly where they assassinate and murder United States citizens, that's our responsibility. I think uh, unilaterally we can take action there from a military standpoint. Now, I'm not saying going into places like Tunisia and bombing a whole area, killing a bunch of women and children. We may want to use a number of various approaches to deal with the terrorists. We might want to use an elite group of, uh, of uh, military people who could go in under the cover of darkness and take out some uh, uh, terrorist leaders and uh, let them know that uh, we did it, but uh, not kill a bunch of innocent people. Uh, when when the, the terrorists have a training camp, their mode of operation, their modus operandi, is that they always surround themselves with women and children, always, so that if a, an airstrike takes place, there's going to be babies killed, there's going to be women killed, there's going to be children killed, and then they immediately show those to the world, making us look like barbarians. But that's because they're trying to protect their terrorist camp. Isn't the um, key issue here that we not shoot ourselves in the foot on this issue? And isn't the problem uh, an issue of just what to do? Well, it's, it, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's not an easy thing to solve, but uh, I have watched since I've been in Congress attacks on our embassies in Kuwait and Beirut. I watched 243 Marines being blown up by a truck full of explosives. I watched airplanes being commandeered and a, an American sailor shot and thrown off the, uh, off onto the tarmac, tarmac in Beirut. Uh, I've watched a, a man on a ship shot and killed and thrown in his wheelchair off the side. I've watched Americans being shot down in airports just because they're buying tickets, doing nothing else. They're just tourists. And uh, these terrorist activities continue to go on and on and on. Now, we can sit back and use harsh rhetoric and uh, uh, the people of the world will say, boy, you sure sound strong, but you can't just talk strong. You've got to take decisive action. And whether, uh, I applaud the president's effort to do it economically uh, f as a first step. But if that doesn't work and these terrorist activities continue, as I'm sure they will, because they've been reaping rich rewards, then I think we're going to have to take stronger action. Dan, uh, let me take you back to a, a political issue again. You mentioned the fact that the Republicans do not have a political majority in the Congress in the House of Representatives. But I think if we look back to 1981 in terms of the tax issues of that, issue, of that particular year, the president had a philosophical majority, so therefore he was able to get his tax measures passed. How does it feel being a member of the minority party and trying to change the system through different kinds of policies? Uh, let me ask you that question, but also a follow-up issue is, what kinds of issues would you change if you uh, had a chance to be in the majority in the House? Well, I think the number one thing that I would change if I were in a majority uh, is that we would have more fiscal responsibility. We passed a budget resolution this year that was going to cut spending by $52 billion. And uh, the first four bills that passed the House after we passed the budget resolution were all in excess of the budget, and the uh, majority in the House, the Democrats, voted overwhelmingly in, 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 in favor of these huge excessive spending programs. One day they pass a budget that's going to reduce spending by $52 billion, and then the next first four bills, three, four bills that pass, are all in excess of that budget act. Uh, that shows fiscal irresponsibility. And if we had the majority, I think we... Uh, in my party would make the hard decisions that are necessary to cut uh, the excesses out of these uh, these uh, proposals. Now you say excesses, but excesses in terms of what particular programs that would be of interest to We We have an awful lot of pork barrel projects. I'm not talking about cutting basic things like education or welfare programs for the truly needy. But we have programs in, in, in the Congress or bills that go through the Congress which provide uh, for for water projects for uh, a tax exempt status for uh, football stadiums or parking garages, and this goes on all over the country. And these are tremendous drains on the federal treasury. And I think by just eliminating these pork barrel projects and this special interest type legislation, we could save this country billions and billions of dollars a year. 
and it isn't done uh, now because those people who are chairman over there have been in for so long and they work deals with their counterparts and other committees to get things done and these pork barrel projects continue to be so, prevalent. Uh, so you're saying that there are no pork barrel projects in the 6th district? No, I don't know of any pork barrel projects. They, they, they wouldn't give them to me if I asked for well, them, but about, I haven't asked for them. How about uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison? Isn't that in a sense a pork barrel project of I mean, that could be, appear to be pork barrel by someone in some other part of the country. Well, first of all, the, uh, the Fort Harrison is right on the edge of my district. It's not in my district. A lot of people who work there live in my district, and I think it's a fine installation. But that's the Army Finance Center and also the Army Physical Fitness Center. And uh, I don't think there's been any excesses out there. Uh, uh, there have been some things proposed which they have not received in the past, so I, I don't know of any pork barrel projects Just, out just there. to quickly follow up then, uh, on that question, uh, this Graham Rudman thing, we've heard a lot about it. Can, uh, can you give us any uh, comments on that? Well, I think Graham Rudman was a step in the right direction, but I had real trouble voting for it. I did vote for it because I felt like we had to get a handle on spending, and it was the, the best game in town. It was the only game in town. But what we did, what the leadership of the House did, Ways and Means, Dan Rost and Kasky, they took 60% of all federal spending programs off the table approximately 60, 55 to 60 percent of all federal spending programs were taken off the table. That only left 40 to 45 percent of total spending uh, where we could make the cuts. I think that was a mistake. We should have put left more on the table. Now we have to cut uh, 36 billion a year out of that little smaller pie and uh, approximately half the cuts will be out of the defense budget. And while I believe we can be more frugal in defense, I think we run a real risk of going too far and cutting not only into the fat, but into the muscle and the bone by making these substantial cuts. So I did vote for Graham Rudman, but I think we've gone a little bit too far with it. Are Republicans not in the least, or the Reagan administration not in the least responsible for this, what is projected to be more than a $200 billion deficit in 86? Uh, I think that uh, there's enough blame to go around for everybody, Larry, uh, but I would say that uh, after having served in the House for three years and watched how the spending bills are so pro proliferate every year, that uh, the House Ways and Means Committee in the House itself uh, is more responsible for the huge deficits than the president. Uh, granted, uh, the White House has done some things that I think have uh, maybe exacerbated the situation, but the main responsibility, I think, rests with the House. The president can't spend one dime until the House and Senate first appropriate the money. 1986, uh, what's Dan Burton's New Year's resolutions for uh, what you're going to get accomplished this year on behalf of the 6th District in the United States? Uh, well, we got a, we had a good farm bill pass, and I'm happy about that, so that, that wasn't part of my New Year's resolution, but that's one thing I'm happy to see. I think that's going to be a step in the right direction. It wasn't perfect, but it's going to help the farmers. I think the thing that I would like to see for the 6th District is a more stable world. I would like to see uh, uh, these terrorist activities and these, uh, these problems, these international tensions recede. I'd like to see us uh, at least come to some kind of an agreement with the Soviet Union, if not a new strategic arms limitation agreement, which I don't think we will get. But I would like to see a better understanding so that they would know where we stand and we know where they stand and we'd be able to see tensions that diminish a little bit. Uh, and I'd like to see uh, uh, a continuation of the revitalization of patriotism in this country. Dan, if, if I could follow up and take you back to politics again. The perception that I have was that the 6th District was set up for Bruce Melcher, and uh, oftentimes I get the impression that Dan Burton becomes the Rodney Dangerfield of the Indiana Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm kind of serious in this in the sense that I get the feeling that the Republicans in the 6th District and in Indianapolis just don't have enough respect for the contribution that Dan Burton is trying to make in Congress. Do you ever feel like... Uh, as, as if you're the Rodney Dangerfield of, of the local Republican Party here in Indiana. Well, I'm sure everybody feels like that, but uh, I do get some respect. Uh, the people of the 6th District elected me by 58,000 votes the first time and 113,000 votes the second time, so we almost doubled our plurality. So somebody out there likes me. I don't know individually. The, the, but as far as the party people are concerned, we did have our differences at the beginning. I mean... Governor Bowen was for my opponent, and Mayor Hudnett was for my opponent, and a number of other people were as well. But we have, uh, we have healed our differences. The wounds are healed. We get along very well. Uh, I supported uh, Governor Bowen for the post he now holds in Washington, D.C., and I think he'll do an excellent job up there. And uh, 
I don't hold any grudges, and I don't believe they do either. So I think I think we're all one big happy family. Well, it's it's a compliment in the sense that I think you are of, of an independent mind, regardless of political position sometimes. And I was just wondering, you know, sometimes the, uh, the establishment of any political party would like to try to own the politician, and you seem to be a person who's owned by your own beliefs. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. I, I would say that uh, every person in public life uh, ought to be his own man or own woman uh, as much as possible. Uh, the only way you're going to be an effective uh, leader, legislator, mayor, governor, whatever, is to be able to uh, vote your convictions, do what you think is correct. And when, you, when you're beholden to somebody else, when they've got you by the nap at the neck every time you cast a vote, then you're, you're not going to be your own man or woman and you're not going to be able to accomplish what you should. Our forefathers created this system of government based upon the premise that each individual person with differing points of view would go speak their mind and stand up for what they believe in and thereby come up with a consensus of what should be done for this country. And I think that's what we should do. As you look at budget cuts, speaking of uh, Doc <clears throat> Bowen, are you looking over at Health and Human Services and looking for his cooperation and cutting back on government spending? Yes, I am. I think uh, Governor Bowen uh, was frugal with the tax dollar here in Indiana when he was governor, and I think he will be likewise in his new position. Uh, every area of government has to come under close scrutiny. If we're going to get this runaway spending under control, we're going to have to look at uh, spending cuts wherever possible. As I said before, we've already taken 60% of the programs off the table. That doesn't leave much to cut. And in that 40 to 45% of the remaining programs, we're going to have to have to do something. Is Health and Human Services going to get its proportionate share, or is it going to hit a, a, a bigger burden of the budget? Yeah, I was asked that question last night, Larry, on another television show, and I'll just tell you, I don't think anybody knows where we're going to make those cuts right now. I mean, a lot of people say where we ought to make the cuts, but it's going to have to be a, a, a compromise situation. Everybody's going to have to sit down on these various committees, make budget cut proposals, and then we're going to have to come up with ones that are workable. Uh, right. So I don't know where we're going to okay. come in. Thank you. Thanks, Congressman Dan Burton, for being our guest today on Public Affairs Roundtable. Thanks also to John Rouse uh, from Political Science Department, producer of Public Affairs Roundtable. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Cecil Bohannon and Bill Mosier. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.